to what degree do people generally suffer from neuroinflammation? Do, do most people have, you know, some level of neuroinflammation that is potentially having a negative impact on their ability to focus? And, you know, as a result of that, maybe their ability to access a state like a flow state? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure a lot of the neuro to really measure no inflammation correctly, you need to do that right now in a research setting in what's called a PET scanner. So you can go to, a, we do, a, our research team have some studies running on neuroinflammation right now. So you get in a scanner and they will inject you with a, a radio ligand that will tag um, a protein that recognizes activated microglia in the brain. And that circulates through you while they image you in a scanner, a specialized PET scanner that can pick that up in the brain. And those PET scanners, though, are only available now at sort of a limited number of research centers. So in other words, you can't really go as a patient to your doctor and say, give me that neuroinflammation PET scan, right? So for that reason, I would say we don't necessarily have the best just sort of gold standard measurements of neuroinflammation in the average person, because we tend to only invest and do that research when it's a, it's a condition, MS or Alzheimer's or, you know, something like that. Right. So that being said, you know, there are just many elements, like I said, that would suggest that, that people would have low level neuroinflammation if any of what I had just described was happening in them. Right. So as I mentioned, you can literally see a route via which the gut microbiome is imbalanced. And now you have perpetual immune cells that are sort of saying, Hey, this, this isn't great here. There's, there's imbalance here. You know, there's too many bad organisms here. And that inflammation will be sensed by the vagus nerve and conveyed to the brain. And at the very least would, you know, logically result in some neuroinflammation, right? So again, you might not have a serious neuroinflammatory disease, but you may have elements of that. It, it, that's entirely feasible to me just from, from a basis of, of logic. And what are some ways that, you know, people can keep the, the negative forms of inflammation that are more chronic low so that they, you know, are at less risk of having impaired function as a result of inflammation that may be you know, not, not severe to the point of needing to go to the doctor, but lingering in there and inhibiting performance. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a doctor, but from a research perspective, you would obviously want to try to keep, especially the gut microbiome in good shape. There are a range of diets and different, you know, therapies out there that people use to try to do that. Um, I think that exploring those possibilities makes sense. Um, a lot of times people eat more paleo or keto often because sugars and carbohydrates will feed, they generally feed bacteria. So bacteria in your gut, sugar and carbohydrates, they metabolize quickly. They can just burn through that and that's the fuel that they need, right? So, so sugar is a, an easy fuel for us, but it's also an easy fuel for our bacterial and fungal organisms. So if you, if your gut microbiome is in a good place and the organisms are in a harmonious place, I would, you know, go ahead and eat some sugar. That's, that's not going to be the worst thing. You almost want to maintain that community. The problem is if you, there starts to be overgrowth of bad bacteria, or for example, candida or different forms of fungi that can be problematic, you don't want to feed that. So you, in some of those cases, patients will actually limit carbohydrates and sugar in their diet, pull those out, and go through a period where they, in a sense, in simple terms, starve those bad organisms so that they can't have access to the easy carbs and sugars, and then bring in some of the probiotics or other things like that to try to improve the gut, and then slowly work back to a point where they're eating more sugars and, and, and other you know, carbs. So in a sense, it you kind of need to know where you're at in that, but you can see how diet can have a pretty big impact depending on, on, on where your gut health stands, right? So just alone, uh, food choices are one obvious <laughs> area. But, you know, other things that I just think make sense from a straightforward perspective are, for example, I'm interested in hyperbaric oxygen therapy or just therapies that oxygenate the human body. <laughs> I don't see any downsides in those because one thing we know is organisms that are like pathogen, especially, which, and by the way, you know, pathogens, single pathogens, for example, the herpes viruses or bacterial pathogens, 
they can get caught up in these in these ecosystems. They can be become players in certain people's you know health issues. They're big drivers of inflammation when they're when they're actively signaling. So none of those pathogens and bad organisms survive well in a highly oxygenated environment. It's kind of a known thing that that pathogens you know actually will induce sometimes what's called a hypoxic state. So they'll actually, when they are causing disease, create sort of genetic or signaling changes that make the area of the body they've infected have lower oxygen called hypoxia. So if you can push back against that and oxygenate the body, oxygenate tissues, you are making the environment less hospitable to negative organisms in, in a simple sense. So some straightforward oxygenation probably wouldn't hurt anyone either.